Once a quiet child with a passion for cooking and sewing, Fritz Harman would grow up to be one of the most gruesome serial killers in history. Known for biting through his victims' Adam's apples and dismembering their bodies, Fritz would eventually be labelled the Butcher of Hanover by the media. Today, we will be covering the disturbing life of Fritz Harman. Born on the 25th of October, 1879, Fritz was the youngest of six siblings born into a shaky marriage. It was rumoured his father Olli had married Fritz's mother Joanna, who was seven years his senior, to obtain the large dowry and inherit the wealth of Joanna's family. Olli was a short-tempered man who constantly cheated on Fritz's mother, which eventually caused him to contract syphilis. Despite the affairs, the two stayed together, and Joanna spoiled her youngest child. Known as a quiet and effeminate boy, Fritz rarely engaged with children from school or outside his family, preferring to play with his sister's dolls and dress in their clothing. Though he was well behaved at school, teachers believed him a spoiled child, prone to daydreaming. It was perhaps this daydreaming that affected his academic performance and caused him to repeat a school year twice. Sadly, at eight years old, Fritz would be molested by one of his teachers and refused to discuss the events of the traumatic incident, even in adulthood. At 15 years of age, Fritz would finish school and go to work as an apprentice locksmith. However, this career choice would not last long, and within a year, Fritz enrolled and departed from military academy on the 4th of April 1895. Fritz did well as a trainee soldier, but soon began to suffer from periodic lapses in consciousness, which was believed to be signs of anxiety neurosis, but was later diagnosed as an equivalent to epilepsy. After spending only five months at military academy, Fritz discharged himself and returned to Hanover to begin working at his father's cigar factory. It is here, at the age of 16, Fritz would begin to lure young boys to secluded areas before sexually assaulting them. After multiple offences of this nature, Fritz would find himself arrested in July of 1896, less than a year after returning from military academy. Undeterred by the arrest, Fritz would continue committing similar offences before the Division for Criminal Matters moved him to a mental institution in February of 1897. A psychiatric evaluation would certify Fritz Harmon as incurably deranged and unfit to stand trial resulting in an order for indefinite confinement. Seven months into his stay, Fritz escaped the mental institution, and with assistance from his mother, fled to Zurich, Switzerland. Here he would stay with a relative of his mother's and work as a handyman in a shipyard for 16 months before returning to Hanover in April 1899, only two years after his life sentence. In early 1900, Fritz would meet Erna Lowett, and proposed to the woman, who soon became pregnant with his child. His time with Erna would be cut short when later in the same year, Fritz received notification that he was to perform his compulsory military service. On October 12th, 1900, the then 21-year-old Fritz was deployed to the Alsatian city of Colmar to serve in the number 10 rifle battalion. During his service, Fritz was described as an excellent soldier and marksman, and later stated his time in the Rifle Battalion was the happiest period of his entire life. As most things were in his life, this time was short-lived. After collapsing during a training exercise with his battalion in 1901, Fritz began to suffer dizzy spells and was hospitalised for over four months. Fritz would be diagnosed with dementia praecox, a psychiatric term no longer used in practice and now replaced by the term schizophrenia. The diagnosis would see him deemed unsuitable for military service and dismissed from the military on July 28, 1902, with a monthly military pension of 21 gold marks. After dismissal, Fritz returned to live with Erna in Hanover, and once again found himself working in the cigar factory, but not long into his employment, he would attempt to file a maintenance lawsuit against his father, citing the inability to work due to the ailments noted by the military. The attempt would prove unsuccessful, and his father would attempt to initiate legal proceedings in retaliation, citing verbal death threats and blackmail as justification to have his son return to a mental institution. These charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence, but Fritz would be ordered to undergo another psychiatric examination. 
The doctor who conducted the examination would state while he believed Fritz was morally inferior, he did not consider him mentally unstable. Apparently not one to hold grudges, Fritz's father then provided funds for Fritz to open a fish selling business under his fiance Erna's name. This would prove a mistake for Fritz, who soon accused his then pregnant fiance of having an affair, which prompted her to call off their engagement and order Fritz off their property. With the business legally in her name, Fritz had no choice but to obey. Without his fiance, child or business, Fritz would begin a life of crime as a thief and con artist, and from 1905 to 1913, Fritz would spend the majority of his time in jail for larceny, embezzlement and assault. Fritz's criminal history would seemingly allow him to turn over a new leaf and work as a police informant. But this new position did little to stop Fritz from committing crime and only enabled him to redirect attention away from himself and facilitate access to the young men he preyed on. His first known murder occurred on the 25th of September 1918, when 17-year-old runaway Fredel Roth would be reported as missing. During a police investigation, Fredel's friends named Fritz as the last person they'd seen with him. After pressure from the boy's family, police would raid Fritz's apartment in October and find him with a partially naked 13-year-old boy. Though they found him committing a crime, they failed to locate the missing runaway Fredel. Police were unable to charge Fritz for Fredel's disappearance, but they were able to charge him with sexual assault and battery of a minor, resulting in a nine-month prison sentence. In spite of the sentence, Fritz delayed his imprisonment throughout 1919 and lived as a free man. In October 1919, Fritz would meet 18-year-old runaway Hans Granz, who at the time was sleeping around the Hanover train station selling old clothes to buy food. Smitten with the young man, Fritz would invite Hans to live with him. However, Hans was not to become a victim of Fritz, but rather manipulated and on occasion mocked him. Though aware of this, Fritz claimed to tolerate it because he craved companionship and affection, stating, I had to have someone I meant everything to. In February 1923, Fritz would meet a 17-year-old pianist named Fritz Frankie at Hanover Central Station and invite him to his apartment. There the young pianist would meet Hans and two female friends, one of which was Hans's lover. According to her, during the evening, Hans leaned over and whispered, Hey, he's going to be trampled on today. The next day, the two women would visit the apartment once more and be told by Fritz that the young pianist had travelled to Hamburg. Whether Hans knew for certain that Fritz planned to murder the boy is unclear, but Fritz would later claim Hans walked into the apartment and found him with the nude corpse of the pianist and simply asked, When shall I come back again? The tactic of targeting lost youth and luring them back to his apartment would become more regular. Fritz would offer his victim food or drink before tightening his hands around the neck and biting into their Adam's apple as he strangled them, an act he referred to as his love bite. Only five weeks after murdering the young pianist, Fritz would meet 17-year-old Wilhelm Schills on the 20th of March at Hanover Station and murder him. Fritz would claim two more victims during this time. 16-year-old Roland Hutch, who disappeared on the 23rd of May, after telling a close friend he intended to run away to join the Marines. And 19-year-old Hans Sonnenfeld, who disappeared on the 31st of May, while on his way to work. In June 1923, Fritz would move to a single-room attic apartment, and two weeks later, his neighbor's 13-year-old son, Ernst Ehrenberg, would go missing after leaving to run errands. On August 24th, 18-year-old office clerk Heinrich Strubb would go missing. 17-year-old Paul Bronachewski would too. Between 1980 and 1924, almost all male youths in the company of Fritz would disappear. As the trend of young men disappearing in Hanover continued, rumours began to circulate about the fate of these missing men, though it appears no official connections were made to a serial killer or Fritz himself. Fritz was able to hide the bodies of his victims by dismembering them and throwing the remains into the Line River. Around this time, Fritz was also known to sell contraband meat, usually boneless, diced and sold as a ground meat, causing rumours to spread after his arrest that the meat he sold was in fact human. 
but it wasn't until May 17th, 1924, that Fritz's unpunished killing spree would start to unfold. On this day, two children playing by the Line River would discover a human skull of a young male bearing evidence of knife wounds. At first, skeptical police believed the skull had found its way into the river via grave robbers, pranksters, or due to bodies flowing downstream from a typhoid outbreak in a nearby town. But two weeks later, another skull belonging to a male youth would appear in the same vicinity as the original. Shortly after the second skull, two boys playing in a field would find a sack containing multiple human bones. Two more skulls would appear in short succession, all young males bearing evidence of having been scalped and their skull removed from the vertebrae. The sheer number of missing youths in Hanover had already birthed rumours and theories on their fates, but the discovery of bones lit a fire within the public. So much so that on June 8th, 1924, several hundred residents came together to search the banks of the Line River. The search party would uncover a number of human bones, which were turned over to police. With the amount of discarded human remains rising, Police dragged the section of the river running through Hanova and unearthed another 500 human bones. On closer examination, police and court doctors were able to surmise the amount of dissected bones found belonged to at least 22 male youths. It didn't take long for suspicion to fall on Fritz, who had a known criminal history dating back to 1896 for offences involving child molestation and the sexual assault and battery of minors. If his record wasn't enough, his employment as a police informant saw him frequent the Hanover Station, a place many of the missing youths were last seen. On the 22nd of June, two undercover police officers tasked with following Fritz would see him arguing with 15-year-old Carl Fromm, before approaching nearby police and insisting they arrest the boy. Once arrested, Carl would inform the police he had been living with Fritz for four days and the man had repeatedly sexually assaulted him at knife point. The following morning, Fritz himself would be arrested and his apartment searched. Police entering the apartment found the flooring, walls and bedding stained with blood, which Fritz attempted to argue was due to his illegal trading of meat. However, when police spoke with Fritz's acquaintances and neighbours, many would speak of the number of teenage boys who passed through his doors. Not only that, they also told police Fritz would often leave his apartment at odd hours with sacks or bags in his possession. Two of his previous neighbours would even state that they had followed him one night in the spring of 1924 and watched him throw a heavy sack into the Line River. Though the stories of his victims could not be pieced together, a multitude of items belonging to those who had disappeared were either found at the apartment or sold by Fritz. Of the large number of items, the hat and suspenders of 13-year-old Ernst Ehrenberg, a violin belonging to Heinrich Strub, a coat and tie belonging to Hans Sonnefield would be found. During the search, police discovered a skull in Fritz's garden belonging to an 18-year-old named Robert Witz. With the mounting evidence against him, Fritz eventually confessed to sexually assaulting, killing, and dismembering a number of young men, calling it a rabid sexual passion. He would tell police he never intended to murder his victims, but would find himself seized by an irresistible urge to bite into his victim's Adam's apple. During the confession, it would be revealed that police had been close to capturing him on October 18, 1918, when they raided his home in search of Fredel Roth. Fritz claimed at the time, Fredel's decapitated head was wrapped in a newspaper and hidden behind the stove, but detectives had failed to find it. Despite confessing to a number of murders, Fritz denied murdering the men who had been found in the Line River, and described his method of dismemberment to police in an attempt to prove it. Insisting he took no joy in the act, Fritz would pour a strong black coffee before placing his victim's body on the apartment floor and covering their face with a cloth. Once on the floor, Fritz would begin removing the intestines and placing them in a bucket. After, he would make three cuts between the victim's ribs and shoulders, then take hold of the ribs and push until the bones around the shoulders broke. The victim's heart, lungs and kidneys would be removed, diced and placed in the same bucket which held the intestines, before the legs and arms would be severed from the body. Once finished, Fritz would trim the flesh from the limbs and dispose of the excess down the toilet or in the nearby river. 
Finally, Fritz would remove the head from the torso using a small kitchen knife to remove the flesh before splintering the skull with an axe to expose the brain. The brain would then be placed in the bucket with the intestines and organs to be later disposed of in the line. It was for this reason he claimed that the young men's skulls found in the river were not his victims as the skulls were not splintered. Though Fritz would offer this detailed information to police, they were aware he was careful only to confess to murders where evidence existed and during interrogation stated, There are some victims you don't know about, but it's not those you think. Police suspected Fritz had committed 27 known murders, but Fritz told police the number was somewhere between 50 and 70. Of the 27 suspected murders, police believed that many were committed due to insistence by his lover Hans Granz, who would later find himself arrested and charged as an accessory to murder. The trial of Fritz Harman took place on the 4th of December 1924, and Fritz himself served as his own defense counsel. Fritz argued his murders were not premeditated, stating his reason for killing was a mystery even to him. While he did confess to killing 14 victims, Fritz denied selling the flesh as black market meat, which would be supported by a medical expert who testified the meat found in his possession at the time was not human. This did not dissuade the testimony of Fritz's landlady, who reported feeling ill after eating sausages and skins Fritz claimed were sheep intestines, nor that of two women close to Hans Granz, who believed they found a human mouth boiling in a soup kettle in Fritz's apartment. The two women claimed they had even taken the item to police, only to be told it was probably a pig's snout. Other neighbours would testify Fritz always left with meat packages, but never entered his apartment with any. During the trial, Fritz was shown photographs of his alleged victims and continued to deny recognising them, even after their belongings were found in his possession. Rather than admit he knew the victim, Fritz would make comments to the effect of, I probably killed him or, charge it to me, it's alright with me. On one occasion when confronted with a picture of a missing youth named Alfred Hogriff, Fritz simply stated, I certainly assume I killed Alfred, but I don't remember his face. A total of 190 people would testify against Fritz, and on the 19th of December 1924, the trial would conclude. Before sentencing, Fritz would speak before the court and say, Condemn me to death, I ask only for justice, I am not mad, make it short, make it soon, deliver me from this life which is torment. I will not petition for mercy nor will I appeal. I want to pass just one more merry night in my cell with coffee, cheese and cigars, after which I will curse my father and go to my execution as if it were a wedding. Fritz was found guilty of 24 murders and sentenced to death by a guillotine. Once the verdict was read to him, Fritz stood up before the court and proclaimed, I accept the verdict fully and freely. I shall go to the decapitating block joyfully and happily. Fritz's lover, on the other hand, did not take his sentence as well. After being implicated in the murder of Adolf Hannapel, Hans was found guilty of incitement to murder and sentenced to death by beheading in relation to the murder of Adolf after witnesses placed him with Fritz pointing to the youth. Fritz would also confess that two murders had been at Hans's request. Upon hearing his verdict, Hans became hysterical, collapsed in his cell, and later attempted to appeal the sentence without success. Fritz was notified of his execution date a day before, and spent his final hours observing a prayer with his pastor, and using his last wish to smoke an expensive cigar and drink Brazilian coffee. At 6am on the 15th of April, a nervous and pale Fritz Harman approached the guillotine and spoke his last words. I am guilty, gentlemen, but hard though it may be, I want to die as a man. Before placing his head inside the guillotine, Fritz added, I repent, but I do not fear death, before the blade took his life. After his execution, sections of Fritz's brain were removed for analysis, revealing traces of meningitis. Not only was his brain taken, but Fritz's head was also preserved in formaldehyde and remained in possession of a medical school from 1925 until 2014 when it was cremated, pictures of which are freely available on the internet. Once gone, a letter written by Fritz and addressed to Hans's father would be discovered. 
In it, Fritz stated Hans was innocent, and the claims Fritz had made against Hans were obtained under duress and as a means of revenge for his treatment as a meal ticket by Hans. With this new evidence, on appeal, Hans was not acquitted, but rather the death sentence lifted. Hans served his two concurrent 12-year sentences, but was subsequently moved to a Nazi concentration camp until the end of World War II. Thank you for listening. I hope I didn't butcher too many names. Some I could Google how to pronounce, others I couldn't. But I hope you enjoyed it, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you.